How's everybody today? It's so nice to be here in front of all of y'all. It's so nice to be in front of so many young people. Young people who grew up in a, in a post-smartphone world. A smartphone is the thing that changed everything. Right? Before we had the smartphone, you had to log on to the internet with a box in the front of your house. It looked something like, yeah, something like that, right? You had this thing called a desktop or a PC. You go to it, you connect to the internet, and the moment you walked out of it, the moment you stepped away, you were disconnected from the internet. There was this concept of logging on to the internet and logging off the internet. But then now, when you grew up, you had this. Well, hopefully you have something better than this. This is the first generation iPhone. You have a smartphone, and that changes everything. Because now, you wake up in the morning and the internet's beside you, ready to go. You can take it to you on the way to work, on the way to school. You can take it to you to the toilet if you want. So the internet changes from something you log on and log off from to something that's with you all the time. It's something created by us all. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, and binds us all together. And if you know your history, you know that's the exact definition of force from Star Wars. So if the internet goes from this to that, what does it do? with a lot so much great potential, right? Apps like Uber and Grab, they wouldn't exist in a pre-smartphone world. You couldn't do Uber and Grab with PCs and desktops. Apps like Food Panda, Deliveroo, Mobike, and Ofo, even apps like Waze and WhatsApp, they don't work in a pre-smartphone world. All that's great. But with this new world, where the internet is like the force from Star Wars, comes new threats and new risks. So you think about it, cybercrime, if it hasn't done so already, will outstrip traditional crime in terms of absolute dollar number value. What that simply means is that it's easier to flip a billion dollars worth of electronic money than it is to flip a billion dollars worth of physical goods. This is a story from about a couple of years ago. It's a group called Lazarus, who think they're not Korean, um, that tried to steal a billion US dollars from the Bangladeshi Central Bank. They almost got away with it, going out for a typo of one of their messages a billion US dollars in one electronic message. Now, if you try to ship a billion US dollars in physical goods, that's very, very hard to do. Whether you want to do that in physical cash and you've got to ship it around, you know, a la Pablo Escobar, or whether you want to do it in gold bars, or as Malaysians, we found out shipping a billion dollars is very hard, especially if that's a billion dollars worth of handbags. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why you're laughing. This guy's quite struggling. <laughs> So today I want to take a step back and talk to you about one of these new threats and risks that are new to Malaysia, that are new to the world actually. We wouldn't have talked about this 10 years ago, we're talking about it today, and it's very pertinent. I want to talk about data breaches. So what is a data breach? A data breach is when an organization, it's a matter whether it's private or public, government, non-government, religious, etc. When the organization has lost control of some of its data and it's ended up in the wrong hands. That's a data breach. Everyone in this room, bar none, everyone in this room has been a victim of a data breach. Or in hacker terms, you call it PWNED. P -W -N -E -D. I want you to remember this term because it's very important. We'll come back to it later. So before we go into that, let's put a framework around how we understand data breaches. Now there are two types of data breaches. There is the malicious type, which you often think about. It's when a hacker comes in, exploits the system, gets the data out, and it may or may not sell it on the internet. These types of data breaches are quite rare. There was one reported yesterday in Singapore, if you know about it, but they're actually very rare. They always make the news because, by definition, they are newsworthy. It doesn't happen very often. What happens more often than the malicious data breaches are the negligent data breaches. This is the one where someone from sales accidentally emails out the client list to the wrong person, or CCs everyone instead of BCC, and everyone knows everybody else's email address, or a top executive leave their laptop in the taxi on the way to the airport. This happens more often than the malicious ones, but the effect is the same, especially the damage it inflicts of victims. Now let's talk about the victims. There's two types of victims as well. There's the organization itself, which may or may not be a victim of its own negligence, but a, but a victim nonetheless. Then there is the data subject. People often don't think about the data subject. If you subscribe to a telco and the telco lost your data, you're a victim. If you bought an insurance policy and the insurance company lost the data, you're a victim. You're a victim as much as the organization itself. In fact, you're more a victim because it's your data. You're the one paying the consequences. It's your privacy that was breached. Now, I said everybody in this room has been a victim of a data breach. 
Here is not even the tip of the iceberg, this is the tip of the tip of the iceberg. It's very, very small. But if you look at the numbers, 150 plus million LinkedIn accounts, 160 million plus Adobe accounts. So you can go online, if you know where to look, you can find this, right? And this is not even uh, not even 1% of the data breaches that we know about. It's a lot of breaches. It's very unlikely that if you use the internet for any reasonable amount of time, that you never subscribe to a service that was breached before. Very, very unlikely. Now, but this, well, this is all international news. It's always big news when a company, when a company gets breached by underground million accounts. What I want to do today is to bring that more, let's say, localized. Let's talk about Malaysia. Because Malaysia, we have our own data breaches. I want to talk about the two biggest data breaches in Malaysia that affects hopefully everyone in this room. The first one is this. It's the mobile data breach, the mobile number breach. If you subscribe to a mobile number, it doesn't matter whether that's from the three big telcos in Malaysia, Cellcom, DT, Maxis, or from the myriad of smaller telcos, you know, uh, PLDT, XOX, TuneTalk, etc. You're in this breach. We have 46.2 million records in this breach. That's a lot. Malaysia only has like 30 million people. Because you subscribe to multiple telcos at the same time, because you have multiple accounts, because it includes foreigners, we get this pretty, pretty big number. We at least, at least have your IC number and your phone number in this breach, at the very least. Or if you're a foreigner, we have your passport. But for most of you, we also have your name, your address, we even have the type of account you subscribe to. Whether that's the 100 ringgit postpaid package or the 300 ringgit postpaid package or the prepaid package. We know all of that about you. Now, maybe some of you say, well, you know, I wasn't really a mobile subscriber in 2014. You know, I wasn't very young. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Let's take the next one. This is the SAPS NPRA data breach. SAPS stands for System Analysis for Quick Sanskola. It's basically a system designed by the Ministry of Education. So the parents can log online and check the exam results of their students. It makes perfect sense. This is the sort of thing you expect from a modern country, from a modern education system. Except that the developers of the system didn't really secure their system. So late one Friday evening, I get a call from a journalist who says, Keith, um, got an email from someone that says he hacked such an PRA. Would you like to take a look at it? I said, of course I'd like to take a look at it. So he sends me the email, I take a look at the site, and yes, first of all, it is exploitable. The person who reported it actually detailed about the steps of how you exploit this. It's actually quite easy. And secondly, they also included data from the system. So the person did just report the vulnerability, they actually executed the vulnerability, got the data out, and now is sharing it with reporters, the smallest of reporters, and then it came to people like me. What's in this breach? If you went to school, public school in Malaysia, in roughly the last decade or so, you're in this breach. 10.2 million records is more then the number of students, because it includes your IC number if you were a student, or your parents' IC number, both father and mother. We have your school name, the class that you went to, the subjects that you took, how well you did, or how well you didn't do in those subjects, your teacher's name, your teacher's IC numbers, everything. We have a lot of private data. Now, if I met you at the corner of the street and asked you your phone number, probably wouldn't give it to a stranger, but I don't have to ask you. I can just go online and download it. The set that you have which isn't online, but it's the same thing. I want you to think about how this makes you feel. How does the home make you feel, right? That someone somewhere at some point in time looked at some pretty sensitive private data about you that they were not authorized to do. Initially, when people learn about data breaches, there's a little bit of shock, there's a little bit of you know, frustration. But then it starts to turn into this uncomfortable feeling. That's the feeling of your privacy being breached. That's the one I want to really hit home today because we often talk about data breaches in terms of economic and financial impacts, you know, how people can use this data to scam you or to perform identity theft. We never talk about really the privacy impact of it. You see, privacy is about context, it's about choice. You need these two things to have a private life. It's not that you keep your private data to yourself and you never share, it's that you have control of who to share it with and how. That's the most important thing. So, for example, if I ask you your age or your salary, some random stranger on the street, you will never give it to me. But if I treat the context and I say, well, you go to a doctor's office and the doctor asks you your age, that's a reasonable question to ask and you might give it to her. If you go and apply for a bank loan and the bank officer asks you, well, what's your salary? Like, reasonable question, you might give it, you might not give it. There are different consequences for it, but you have control. In the concept of a data breach, there is no context, there is no choice. All of this data is there. If I wanted to, 
I don't have to ask you, I don't have to ask permission, there is no context. All I need is an internet connection, and I know where to look. And it's not that hard to find where to look. So data breaches are like doxing at a massive level. This is a picture from a couple of years ago, video and viral Malaysia. And this lady, as you can see, she's got a steering wheel and she went a bit crazy. Um, but people soon figure out, well, I can see the number plate in this car. They figured out the name, they figured out the phone number, they figured out where she worked, they figured out her IC number, and they were publishing this on social media. We know this is harmful, we know this, this is hurtful, because this is how doxing works. When we want to hurt somebody, we expose their private data. Data breaches are like doxing at a massive scale. All the stuff we talk about the internet, the scalability itself, all of that cuts both ways. Right? You can be used for good and for bad. That's the real reason why data breaches are bad. It's not about the financial impact or the economic impact. It's about the breach in privacy, which is the real bad thing. So data breaches are harmful in and of themselves and should be avoided. So what can you do? Let's break them into two parts. What can you do and what can the government do in terms of regulation? So the first part is what can you do? Well, first of all, you want to think of data as currency. Think of data as your data, your personal data, as value. It really does. Companies like Facebook and Google and Twitter, they're not multi-billion dollar companies because they give away free stuff. They're multi-billion dollar companies because they have your data. So when you go to a coffee shop and the guy says, would you like to join our logic program, you get a free cup of coffee, you say, why not, it's a free cup of coffee. But the reality is that what they're actually saying is that I would like to buy your personal data for a cup of coffee. That may cost five dollars, but it just cost me a dollar to make. Would you like to join? And if you think about it that way, why would I get my name, maybe my IC, maybe my address, maybe my preferences, my shopping habits, for a mere dollar coffee? Does it make sense? When you start to think of your data as having value, you start to subscribe to less of these logic services, and the potential that you end up with a breach is less because your data is less out there. The second thing you want to do, and to take a step back, is don't reuse passwords. So, if you take a step back, all of the stuff we've talked about before, the Adobe brief, the LinkedIn brief, the Yahoo brief, usually what comes out of these breaches are username and password combinations. Right? And a quirk of human nature is that we tend to reuse the same username and password everywhere we go. So your banking username and password is the same as your telco username and password. It's the same as the password you use to log on to this little anime forum that you are a fan of. But it turns out when the anime forum gets breached, that username and password combination is exposed. And attackers use it and they try it everywhere. Maybe they get access to a Gmail account. And now they can send out emails to your name and read all your personal emails. Maybe they can use it to log into your banking account. And now they can cause you some real financial damage. The only way around this is to use unique passwords for every service that you have and make sure that it's strong. The only way to do that is with a password manager to look it up. It's very important. And the last thing is be informed. This is the website called Have I Been Told. And if you go to it, you enter your email address and it tells you which breaches your email addresses have been a part of. And that allows you at least to know what of your data might be exposed. So the next time somebody calls you and says, I have your IC number and I have your family IC number, that means nothing. It just means you have a connection to the internet. That means absolutely nothing. And you, if you are informed, you can address this. Now let's move on to the government. What can the government do? Well, in Malaysia at least, we can enforce we can enforce the PDPA, the Personal Data Protection Act. There is a principle in the PDPA, this is a security principle, and that's basically that companies must take sufficient steps to protect your personal data. Now, we don't really have to go and do a deep forensic analysis of companies to figure out whether they're taking good sufficient steps. You can ask some very simple questions. If a company is bringing in $100 million worth of revenue and spend 1,000 clients on their list, I mean, how much money are they actually spending on security? who's the highest ranking officer in the company, whose job it is to look after security and security only. And with that, some very red flags get pumped up very quickly. The second thing you want to do, especially from a Malaysian context, is to remove information from your MyCard number. Your MyCard number in Malaysia, your identification card number, has your age, the state which you were born, and your gender all encapsulated inside of it. It has your age right down to the actual day. And when you go to a condominium or any other private property, you usually have to identify yourself and give your my card. That's actually a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You're entering private property, the owner of the property is asking you to identify yourself, and in Malaysia, the my card is the best way to do that. Unfortunately, you can't do that without revealing your age. You can't do that without revealing your gender. And in all of these breaches that we talked about, and we have a lot in Malaysia, I just covered two, the my card number always comes up. And it has all this information when it doesn't really need to be identifier 
doesn't need to carry information about you. And finally, you want to have credit freezes. Today, if you take a loan from any bank and you default on it, no other bank in the country will give you another loan. If you subscribe to a telco and you don't get the telco, no other telco is going to give you a post free account anymore. They have mechanisms to prevent people from applying new accounts, but it's all geared towards protecting the company. What we should do is reach out individuals to say, well, you know what, I've got enough loans, I don't want to take another loan, freeze my credit. So that even if someone has all the data on you, they can't take a loan in your name because you have frozen your credit. Sure, this makes it a bit inconvenient, but the security gets better. So with those steps together, and hopefully now you have a better understanding of data breaches, you can work towards not just reducing the incidence of data breaches, how often they occur, it will never be zero, but at least you can get it down lower than what it is today, as well as the impact on individuals when it does occur. Thank you, and goodbye.